consider the third chapter of the Gospel of John and how Christ characterizes judgment. Now, I didn't put the, go through the entire third chapter, but this is the passage from Nicodemus where he says you must be born again. And he's having a theological discourse with Nicodemus and we get to John 3.16, which everybody's heard. We dealt with last week. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever should believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. There's a few more verses after that that people forget to mention. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came in the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light. For their actions were evil. And all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear that their sins will be exposed. This theological discourse with the highly esteemed Nicodemus is one in which Christ espouses that only those who have been spiritually born will witness or be part of the kingdom that Jewish culture and religion had so eagerly anticipated. Christ further explains that the judgment of who would be part of the kingdom and who would be made or would, would be made on the basis of statements made by beliefs and behaviors of an individual. So in other words, when we read through that, Christ is saying that the people that are in the kingdom versus the people that aren't in the kingdom is going to be evaluated based on people's beliefs and their actions that are born of those beliefs. Not because I decide you're not going to be in there, but because you decide that you don't want to be in there. If people are going to be free to reject Christ, they must be free to be without him forever. He presents that an individual on the basis of their own choices qualify or disqualify themselves from the kingdom and that God will honor that choice. This characterization is different from a retributive act of punishment that Western Americans see in the heaven or hell dynamic delineated in scripture. So people ask, why would a loving God send people to hell? We say, God don't send nobody to hell, people send themselves to hell. It's a legitimate answer. It's a legitimate answer that God has established a cause and effect relationship within the world. If I jump off a building, I'm a fall because there's something that's established that's going to cause me to fall unless God extends mercy and allows me to levitate. Otherwise, this has already been said. You jump, you dead. You, that, that's it. Game over. We don't blame God for that, for letting them fall because gravity is a part of the natural laws of existence mm -hmm. and within the laws of the cosmic order or the spiritual order that people, that there is a, that there will be a peak, there are a people that are in the kingdom, and there's everybody else. Who's in the kingdom, who's not in the kingdom, is it something that God judges, except for the idea that he does not extend mercy past a certain point to protect them from their own decisions. Okay. God could, maybe, and this is probably a theologically incorrect statement, but for the purposes of discussion, we're going to roll with it. God could say, all right, everybody in. But that is completely contrary to the order he's already established. You have the option of making your choice, and so, and so the fact that I don't extend mercy to protect you from that choice means that I have judged that you are going to experience those consequences, but I'm not punishing you. This is just a natural effect of what you decide. So is it retributive or is it relational? This argument and the, when you look through this passage of scripture, for example, or you read other passages of scripture throughout the New Testament, and, and we'll deal with why I take the New Testament as opposed to the Old Testament in a second. But when you deal with passages through the New Testament, it doesn't point the picture of punishment and retribution. That's something we derive from the Old Testament, and we think they're in conflict with each other because we don't understand the meta narratives or the grand story of the Bible. We'll get there in just one second. But as it relates to misunderstanding judgment, people perceive, people perceive in spiritual communities properly a punishment, reward, curse, blessings, hate, love dichotomy. That's where, how we characterize the judgment of God. Accordingly, people believe on the basis of their lack of compliance or failure to obey that God will disown or devalue them as an individual. This misconception is highly contributory in the Christian struggle with shame. 
So because I believe that God's, that, that judgment is punitive, I determined that God must not love me as much, that I must be less valuable as opposed to realizing that I have the responsibility beyond the choices that I make. It's a different paradigm presented within that. 